welcome back to fill three this is the start of week eight of the course let's get started by talking about the plan for this week I decided over the weekend that it might be a good idea to spend a little more time on chapter six so that's exactly what we're going to do today we're going to review some of the concepts from chapter six today and there will also be a Q&A that includes some questions that you all sent in last week. And then on Wednesday, we'll turn to chapter seven and we'll just be looking at section 7.1. Your homework for this week will just be some exercises from section 7.1. Okay, let's get started with some review. And let's start by taking a look at an example argument. So here's an argument. If it's raining, the ground is wet and the ground is wet, so it's definitely raining. All right, a pretty boring argument, but at this point in the course, we can actually say a whole lot about this argument. First off, we know that it's a deductive argument, and we might think that the word definitely in the conclusion indicates this, that there's a degree of certainty involved with this argument, that the premises are meant to lend necessary support for the conclusion. Second off, we know that this is a kind of hypothetical syllogism just because it has a conditional premise. Um, notice that this isn't what we're going to call a pure hypothetical syllogism, like the kind that we uh, talked about in chapter six, but it is one kind of hypothetical syllogism just because it has uh, a conditional premise. And then finally, we can say something about whether this argument is valid or invalid. Of course, we've got a number of different ways to test this at this point. So maybe maybe even if we can't tell if it's valid or invalid, um, just by looking at it, uh, we, we have all these other tests at our disposal in order to determine that uh, this is valid or invalid. So how exactly can we tell whether this argument is valid or invalid? At this point in the course, we've got a bunch of different ways to potentially figure this out. In chapter one, we talked about the counterexample method. According to that method, if we can produce a counterexample, then we can prove the argument to be invalid. Remember that this particular method was a little bit restricted in terms of what it could prove. The counterexample method can prove that an argument is invalid, but it can't prove that an argument is valid. But if we can produce a successful counterexample, then we can show that this argument is invalid. Second, we now have traditional truth tables. So if we can find a line on the traditional truth table with true premises and a false conclusion, then we know we've got an invalid argument. If we can't find such a line on the full truth table, then we've got a valid argument. We've also now discussed the indirect truth table method, which is kind of a shortcut method, remember. And according to that method, if we assume that the argument is invalid, if we assume that there's a line with true premises and a false conclusion, and then we reach a contradiction, then we know that the argument is valid our original assumption was mistaken. On the other hand, if we don't reach a, a contradiction and we can successfully show how the premises could be true and the conclusion false, then we know we've got an invalid argument. And finally, we can just take a look at the argument's form, its, its abstract logical form. If the argument instantiates a valid argument form, then we know we've got a valid argument. If, on the other hand, the argument instantiates a characteristically invalid argument form, then we have what's known as a defeasible reason in favor of thinking that it's invalid. Now, defeasible just means that um, we, we could be mistaken about it. So we, we could get some evidence that makes us think the other way. Um, so it, while it's some reason in favor of thinking that it's invalid, if it instantiates an invalid form, there could be countervailing evidence. There could be other reasons to think that it's actually valid. You know, maybe the conclusion is a tautology, that sort of thing. Okay, so again, four different ways to tell whether this argument is valid or invalid. Let's take a closer look at each of them. <laughs> 
Okay, first off, for all of these ways of testing for validity or invalidity, it's going to be helpful to have the argument's logical form at hand. So let's get that first. Again, the argument is if it's raining, the ground is wet, and the ground is wet, so it's definitely raining. Let's use the statement letter R for it's raining, and let's use W for the ground is wet. And so we get two premises and a conclusion. The first is the conditional premise. If it's raining, then the ground is wet. So R horseshoe W. Second premise is just the simple statement W, ground is wet. And then the conclusion is that it's raining. So we have R there on the third line. Okay, let's start with the counterexample method. Remember that the first step with the counterexample method is to get the, the argument's logical form. So our first step for the counterexample method is already complete. Um, now, the tougher part of the counterexample method is coming up with an argument that has the same logical form but has obviously true premises and an obviously false conclusion. That's going to be the best kind of counterexample. And here it turns out that we actually can provide such a counterexample. Here is an argument with the same logical form. First premise, if UCSB is in Los Angeles, then UCSB is in California. That's true. Second premise, UCSB is in California. That's true. And then finally, so UCSB is in Los Angeles, which is obviously false. So we know based on the counterexample method alone that this is an invalid argument. Um, but let's still take a look at the other ways of testing for validity and see how we can reach the, the same conclusion. Next, we have the traditional truth table. And by traditional truth table, I just mean the complete truth table. We're going to fill in the entire thing here. And the first step is to include all of our possible truth, truth values for the, the simple statements. And as we know, we can put the simple statements out to the left-hand side, and we can fill in all the possibilities there. This one, we've got simple statements as our conclusion and as one of the premises. So I'm thinking we can just put the truth values under those. We don't need separate columns for um, those simple statements. So let's go ahead and put all of our possibilities in here um, with W. Let's go with T, F, T, F. And with R, let's go with T, T, F, F. Okay. And now we can bring over these truth values to the first premise. And under W, we'll have T, F, T, F. One thing I'll mention too is that it's always good to separate the premises from the conclusion. So let's put an additional line here. So we've got a double line to indicate that we've got the premises on the left hand side and the conclusion on the right hand side. Okay. And then underneath the R, we have T, T, F, F. Okay, and now we're in a position to evaluate the um, conditional here. So we know this is going to be true. We know that this is going to be false. Just given the definition of the horseshoe, we know that this is going to be true, and we know that this is going to be true. Okay, and now in order to test for validity, we need to circle the lines under the main operators if there is a main operator in all these statements. Um, so we'll have the uh, column underneath the horseshoe. For these simple statements, we can just circle what we've got. Okay. And now the question is whether we can find a line with true premises in a false conclusion. If we can find such a line, then we know this is an invalid argument. Uh, if we can't find one of these lines, we know that this is a valid argument. Now, given that we've already produced a counterexample, um, 
we know that it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So we're kind of already expecting to see one of these lines. And in fact, we do. The, the third row is a line where the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So we see a T right here and a T right there and then an F right there. So this truth table also shows that this argument is invalid. Now let's do an indirect truth table. First step with an indirect truth table is to assume that the premises are true and that the conclusion is false. So let's put a T under the horseshoe. And we put a T under the horseshoe there because that's the main operator of the first premise. Um, shows that the whole statement is true. Next, we'll put a T under the W and then we'll put an F under the conclusion. Go ahead and separate, put a double line here to indicate that the conclusion is on the right hand side and we've got the premises on the left hand side. So now the trick is to see if we can work backwards without it resulting in a contradiction. If we can fill in the rest of the truth values on this table without reaching some kind of contradiction, then we know we've got an invalid argument. If we do reach a contradiction, then we know we've got a valid argument. So we already know that on this line, W is going to be true. So we'll put a T underneath the W. And then we already know that R is going to be false. So we'll put an, an F underneath the R. And there we've successfully filled in uh, this truth table, this particular line without reaching a contradiction. So it is possible for this argument to have true premises and a false conclusion. In fact, we saw this actual line on our traditional truth table. Uh, this was kind of just a shortcut to arriving at this line. So again, by the indirect truth table method, we can see that this is invalid as well. Okay, finally, we know that we can at least sometimes know whether an argument is valid or invalid just by looking at its logical form. And in this particular case, we see that the argument instantiates a, an argument form that is familiar to us at this point. Um, this is one of the invalid argument forms that we talked about in chapter six, known as affirming the consequent. It's called affirming the consequent because it's got a conditional premise. The first premise is a conditional with an antecedent and a consequent. R is the antecedent and W is the consequent. And then in the second premise, the consequent of that conditional is affirmed. It says the consequent is true. And then in the conclusion, the antecedent is inferred. Now, usually any instance of this argument form affirming the consequent is going to be invalid. So on the whole, most of the time, an instance of affirming the consequent is going to be invalid. That's not always the case for some reasons that we discussed last week. You know, the argument, the argument's conclusion could be a tautology. If an argument has a conclusion that's a tautology, it's always going to be valid, even if it instantiates affirming the consequent. But this particular argument is invalid. Um, if we had started with this method, if we had noticed at the beginning that this was an instance of affirming the consequent, we still might not have known for sure that it was invalid, but we could have thought to ourselves, oh, it's a pretty good indication that it's invalid. Maybe I can do a truth table um, or maybe I can come up with a counterexample to prove that it's invalid. And of course, we've already done this. So we, we know for sure that this is an invalid argument. Um, but I do wanna mention that, that caveat that while the argument form here is a good indication that it's invalid, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's invalid. Okay, let's wrap things up for today with our weekly Q&A. These are just some questions that we received from you all last week on chapter six. Uh, 
First question, why must there be a contradiction on each line of an indirect truth table for the argument to be valid? This is a really good question and it's something you have to be careful about. Even if one of the lines on your indirect truth table leads to a contradiction, that doesn't mean all of the lines will result in one. And so why does it matter whether all of the lines on the indirect truth table result in a contradiction? Well, if you end up with a line that doesn't have a contradiction, that means you've successfully come up with an interpretation of that argument where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, meaning that the argument is invalid. So this is why if your indirect truth table has multiple lines, you need to show a contradiction on all of the lines in order uh, for the argument to be proven valid. Second, are there more valid argument forms beyond those uh, mentioned in section 6.6? .6? Yes, we'll encounter more valid argument forms in chapter seven. Really, there are tons of valid argument forms, but we're going to be studying those that are particularly useful to know. Number three, here's a quiz question. If the truth table for an argument reveals that it is possible for both the premises and the conclusion to be false, then the argument is automatically invalid. Why is this false? Remember that the only way an argument is invalid is if it has a line on its truth table with true premises and a false conclusion. Because of this, it doesn't really matter if there's a line with false premises and a false conclusion. This by itself isn't enough to know that an argument is invalid. Number four, would A implies B be translated into A dot B? Um, the answer to this one is no. A implies B would be translated into A horseshoe B. Remember that the horseshoe is used for material implication. And so if you've got a, if you've got a statement um, that involves implication like A implies B, it's a good indication that you need to use horseshoe um, in order to translate that. It's like a conditional. A implies B is very similar to if A, then B. Okay, number five, what's the point of knowing invalid argument forms if not all of their instances are invalid? I like this question. Uh, we know that all instances of valid argument forms are valid, but we know that the same thing doesn't hold for invalid arguments. It's not the case that all instances of invalid argument forms are invalid. So why care about the so-called invalid forms if they don't guarantee invalidity? Well, the reason is that for the most part, the invalid forms are still a pretty reliable guide to invalidity. If an argument instantiates an invalid form, then chances are the argument is invalid, but we just have to watch out for weird cases, like when the conclusion is a tautology. Number six, how can a conclusion be a tautology? The conclusion of an argument is a tautology if there are T's on each line underneath the main operator of the conclusion. So if the conclusion is, for example, if P then P, that's a logical truth, a tautology. Um, any argument with this as a conclusion will automatically be valid because there's not gonna be a possible way for the premises to be true, but the conclusion to be false. It's just not possible for the conclusion to be false at all. Number seven, are disjunctions the only operators with the commutative property? This is a good question. To say that an operator is commutative is to say that you can flip the non-logical elements on each side of the operator and get a logically equivalent statement as a result. For example, A or B or A wedge B is logically equivalent to B wedge A, B or A. Um, we just flip the A and the B there logically equivalent. Now to the question, do other operators work this way? Uh, the answer is yes, conjunction works this way. So A dot B, A and B is logically equivalent to B dot A. A, a minor point to keep in mind about conjunction, as we saw at the end of section 6.2, commuting a conjunction in English does not always preserve meaning. 
Um, but the point remains that conjunction in propositional logic is commutative. You can flip conjunctions in our system without altering the logical content of the statement. Number eight, can an argument be valid even if its corresponding conditional is a tautology? No, if an argument's corresponding conditional is not a tautology, this means that there's a line on the argument's truth table with true premises and a false conclusion. So by definition, this would mean that it's an invalid argument. Number nine, like in math class, where you can sometimes plug in the answer to check your work, is there a way to tell if you correctly filled in a truth table for an argument? Uh, yes, there, there are some things you can do here. The first thing you can do is look back over your truth table to see if you accounted for all the possible combinations of truth values. Uh, you can make sure that you computed all the truth values under the operators correctly, that, that kind of thing. Beyond that, you can use the various methods of proof that we've encountered so far in the class. So suppose you fill out a regular truth table and an argument comes out valid. Something you might ask yourself is whether the argument instantiates one of the valid argument forms that we've talked about in class. If the argument does instantiate a valid form, this le lends credence to the idea that you've correctly filled out your truth table. Another thing you might do is fill out an indirect truth table. If you reach a contradiction with your indirect truth table, this lends even more credence to the idea that you filled out your original truth table correctly. So these are the ways that you can check your work. You can use the different methods you have at your disposal and check them against each other. Okay, last question for today. In the context of constructing indirect truth tables, what does it mean to say that the truth values are underdetermined? In this context, by underdetermined, we mean that we don't have enough information to fill in the rest of the line on the truth table. And this is how we end up needing more lines. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there for today. And on Wednesday, we'll move on to chapter seven.